Can you hear us? Hello. Yep, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Awesome. Yeah, we can hear you. Perfect. It's so exciting to have you here with us, Rob. Yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. And thanks, everybody, for coming out. Yeah, no worries. So uh, we, we have a small crowd today, but everybody's really excited to see you. And um, nice. listen, so let's just get to it. Uh, please give us, give us a, your recap of this year in EOS and how Cypherglass has uh, contributed to the EOS ecosystem. And why should you guys be consistently in the top 21 block producers in EOS? Go. Perfect. Awesome. I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen here. Give me one second. Let's see. Nice. Yeah, we can see it. All right, looks good. Yeah. Hold on one. Perfect. There we go. Everybody can see that. Yep. yep. Awesome. So as uh, Hernan said, I definitely want to talk about the last year in EOS. I know uh, it's been kind of a crazy ride. And before that, even you could argue that we had about a year of EOS as well, um, since it was announced by Dan and Brennan at Consensus 2017. But I think because things move so quickly in this space, as we've seen, it's important to sort of take a moment and look back on all we've accomplished in the last year. Uh, before we get started, a quick little note about me. Most of you probably already know who I, I am. You've seen me on YouTube, but uh, to give a little bit of background, uh, I first discovered crypto back in 2013 with Bitcoin and just kind of dove down that rabbit hole. And uh, since that point, I participated in Bitcoin, Ethereum, Lisk, Rise, and so many other blockchain communities. And I think, you know, coming to EOS now, that's given me a lot of interesting insight into how these different communities operate and why some operate faster than others and what the different values are in each of these different communities. And now, as most of you know, I run an EOS block producer called Cypherglass and uh, build and invest in crypto companies full time. So this was kind of a dream I had back in 2013 that one day I would be able to go full time in crypto. And as of 2017, that's been a reality. So very, very uh, thankful for that. And uh, if you are building on EOS in the audience, maybe it's you or your team or somebody you know, uh, let me know. I do 100% free consulting calls. So if you're maybe building on Ethereum or building on Neo or something, and you're like, hey, is, is EOS the right platform for me? I will walk you through it. I'll give you some of the overviews. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but I would love to chat about you and uh, your project. So diving into it, I thought a good way to do this would be to kind of go over the big EOS milestones from each month over the last year. Now, obviously, way more has happened in EOS and crypto overall in the last year, but these were sort of the 12 things that I wanted to pull out and highlight during this presentation. All right, so June 2018, of course, the EOS mainnet was launched, and this was a pretty crazy process. If you weren't uh, a block producer participating in the BP calls, it was really uh, pretty amazing coordination for more than 200 block producer teams all around the world doing what were called go and no-go votes. So during these go, no-go votes, everybody would basically vote, hey, do we want to go and launch the mainnet, or are there other things we need to do? Do we need to fix a bug? Do we need to test more? And uh, it took several weeks until we were finally like, okay, here's the go vote. Let's go ahead and launch it. And the EOS mainnet was launched through this rather complex process. Uh, but then what was very cool is that it actually required 15% of all token holders to vote for block producers to unlock the chain. So it was truly a collaborative launch between the block producers and the actual token holders. So very, very cool. And Honestly, the coordination involved to launch the EOS mainnet is like nothing I've ever seen in any other community. Moving on to July 2018, as uh, that RAM price, RAM is one of those resources on EOS that allows you to store data. You can store you know, your account and token balances. You can store other data relative to dApps. And when the EOS mainnet launched, it was limited to just 64 gigabytes of RAM. And uh, speculators got a hold of that. They started buying it like crazy. The price went parabolic. And uh, block producers got together and said, hey, wait a minute, isn't this supposed to be cheap? Isn't it supposed to be affordable for developers? And using the built-in EOS governance system, the block producers actually voted to upgrade RAM so that a little bit would be added every block. And this is sort of the beginning of this governance story where for the first time on any chain I've ever seen, we've been able to continually seamlessly upgrade the network without any hard forks, without any soft forks, anything like that. Uh, it's all been very, very seamless and uh, very, very cool. 
So moving on to August 2018, the building of the referendum system began. Now, after the RAM uh, you know, was upgraded, we added more RAM to the total supply. There were all of these other things that we realized, hey, wait a minute, we need to pull token holders on this. You know, if we want to uh, eventually do something with that 4% inflation, whether it's burn it like we've done recently or something else, we need to pull token holders and ask them for their opinion. So EOS Canada and a bunch of other great teams started building out the referendum system, uh, which would actually launch in 2019. In September, we saw a lot, and this was sort of a continuation, it happened in months previous as well, but we saw a lot of this we love DM spam. And there was this account, Block Twitter, and a couple other accounts as well, just essentially spamming the chain over and over, using their resources on the chain. But what was so cool about this is that it really proved just how scalable the EOS mainnet was. We hit almost 4,000 transactions per second over a sustained period of time. The network was fine. Obviously, it was a, a little bit congested at that point, but it's since been upgraded many more times. Um, so now the scalability is actually far beyond what we've hit in a live environment with 4,000 transactions per second. Rob, what, what's BM actually? Uh, yeah, Byte Master. It's Dan Larimer, his uh, handle on social media. So it was you know, sort of something saying, hey, we love Byte Master, but at the same time proving um, just how scalable EOS was. And then in October, this was pretty cool and also unprecedented for a blockchain where uh, the block producers, uh, several of them actually built this very cool tool that enabled people to cryptographically prove that they owned the Ethereum address associated with their EOS mainnet account. So if you forgot to register, maybe you didn't know you had to register your tokens to move them to the EOS mainnet, you were actually able to recover them. And this was a, a pretty historic moment for a lot of people, almost 20,000 accounts that were able to now be recovered uh, thanks to this. Uh, in November, we had the first ECAF ruling. And of course, ECAF has been removed. The community realized, you know, hey, this is not something we want. But the reason why I really wanted to highlight this is because it, it really shows the path that the EOS mainnet has taken from a governance standpoint. You know, block producers are there. We've been voting on different upgrade proposals. Uh, once the referendum system was live, we had token holders voting on those proposals as well. But ECAF was kind of this interesting experiment in having a centralized entity sort of determine, hey, this person's account has been stolen. Let's get them to cryptographically sign something with their Ethereum address that's associated and allow them to recover their account. So in November, the first ECAF ruling went down. It caused a lot of FUD in the crypto world, uh, but ultimately led us on a path to discovering what it is the EOS community truly wanted when it came to governance. And ECAF clearly was not it. Uh, in December, we saw even more EOSVC announcements. We had uh, Galaxy Digital invest in Good Money, which is a bank that's actually building on EOS. Shortly before that, we had Mythical Games, which is a group of AAA game developers who built World of Warcraft, Call of Duty. These are massive gaming titles, and they announced, hey, we're launching a new studio, we're bringing it to EOS, and of course, so much more. And if you're not familiar with EOSVC, it is a billion dollar DAP fund dedicated to building projects on top of EOS. Then moving on to this year, it's crazy how much has happened. Uh, but like I said, these are only a couple of the highlights. There was a lot of other things that happened during this time as well. In January, this actually started at the end of 2018, but in January 2019, especially, we had a gambling dap explosion. And the reason why I wanted to highlight this, whether you love gambling or you hate it for moral or re moral reasons or uh, whatever it may be, it, it really proved the power of the EOS mainnet. We have never seen a dApp before do a quarter billion dollars in volume in a week. And these gambling dApps enabled that and really showed just how scalable dApps on EOS could be. So this was a super exciting time uh, for a lot of people. Uh, I think all of us just being able to watch it and see, you know, so many millions and millions of transactions happening on the EOS mainnet in a single day. Uh, in February of this year, we got another awesome announcement along with many others like Effect AI moving from NEO over to EOS, who I think you'll hear from later, uh, Chris, over at Effect AI. Uh, but Tapatalk is a company that powers forum software for more than 200,000 forums on the internet and has 300 million forum users across those individual forums. And they announced, hey, we have a new software platform for these forums that we are building on EOS. So 300 million potential new people exposed to the EOS ecosystem. Pretty crazy. And you can start to see uh, EOS VC having a really big role in bringing a lot of these people over. In March of this year, EOS continued to set blockchain usage records. So we smashed through things like daily active users of dApps, 24-hour volume of dApps, seven-day volume, 30-day volume, uh, total transactions, the amount of actions executed on a blockchain, pretty much every metric out there that exists when it comes to usage rather than price, just focusing on the actual usage, EOS is number one and continues to set records today with total actions on the chain, the amount of users, 
uh, it, it's pretty wild to see. And as a lot of you know, we recently hit 1 million accounts on the EOS mainnet. And uh, that brings us to April. Like I said, the, the million accounts, which is kind of what we're celebrating here at this EOS Israel event today. Uh, but then, of course, we had the Rex launch. And Rex, for those of you that don't know, is a resource exchange that essentially makes a very efficient network-wide market for CPU power. So if you're a developer, you need that CPU power to be able to send transactions. Rex makes it super easy to get a hold of that for a very low cost and also offers passive income to people who hold EOS tokens. So this was a pretty monumental launch. It's something that I think will be a base platform for uh, a lot of value to the EOS token holders in the future. Are you and of course, personal, yeah, go ahead. are you staking your Rex, Rob? Uh, you I have some of, my, some of my EOS stake to Rex, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it's a, a great system and there are so many different interfaces. You can use EOSREX.io, you can use Blocks.io. There are all kinds of different interfaces that you can use to access it. Uh, very, very cool. And then May of this year, of course, that's this month that we're in right now. We just had the big burn where first the token holders voted and uh, I believe it was 99.9% .9 out of all the people that voted on this referendum, that referendum system from EOS Canada that I mentioned, uh, to burn the 4% accumulated inflation in the EOSIO.saving account. So this was almost $160 million that everybody got together, voted to burn. The block producers then voted on their own on behalf of the token holders and put that burn into place. And then, of course, this presentation wouldn't be complete without a little bit of a plug for what we're doing at Cypherglass. Uh, many of you have seen EOS name service at eosnameservice.io. We allow you to register these cool custom EOS account names, like mine is rob.vr. Uh, you get herdin.eos. You get so many different account names um, and, and really sort of represent yourself on chain. But what's very cool is we have a partnership launching this month for the beta of EOS DNS. And EOS DNS is created by the people at EOS Cafe Block to actually turn those EOS account names like rob.vr into decentralized domain names where you could host a website. You could redirect to your Twitter or to your uh, block producer website. You can essentially do anything you could do with a traditional domain now with an EOS account in this decentralized DNS system. So that's something we're super excited about and launches later this month before B1. Is it something that's going to work on all browsers? Like you're gonna put Rob BR on, on the top of your Chrome browser and it's going to take to the place that you're redirecting to? Yeah, so the initial version, the beta that launches this month will just be Chrome only, but you'll be basically be able to type, instead of typing HTTP colon slash slash, you'll type EOS colon slash slash rob.vr, for example, to go to my website. So we're pretty excited about it and um, look to extend that to other browsers, to a desktop client, to so much more in the near future as well. And then coming up in June, the thing that everybody is super excited about, of course, we have B1 June, which is the first huge EOS event from Block One coming up next month. Uh, on June 1st, and whether they release EOS IO v2.0 or a social media network or wallet or maybe all of those things, uh, I know everybody's super excited about it and uh, I'm sure it's gonna be something great for the entire EOS ecosystem. So now that we know what's happened from June 2018 to now, almost June 2019, I wanted to highlight a couple of things that I hope we will see over the next year. And these are just sort of high level goals, things that uh, I'm hoping will happen within the EOS community and things that I definitely think are possible based on what's happened in just the last 12 months. So the first thing I hope we see is a DAP with a million users. We've heard Brock Pierce say this. I think we heard Brendan Bloomer say this. We've heard a lot of people say this. And uh, I think it gives us a little bit of an insight into what Block One may be launching as well. Maybe they are launching a DAP and they think they can hit a million users with it. But hitting this milestone, something that no DAP has ever even gotten close to on any blockchain platform, I think would really solidify EOS as the number one blockchain platform for building DAP. So that's something I really hope we see. And maybe it'll be social media. Maybe it'll be the upcoming Blancos game from Mythical Games. Uh, any of those, I think, have a, a good chance of, of hitting a million users. I also hope we will see true mainstream adoption. Now, mainstream adoption is a term that people throw around a lot, and I think everybody kind of has a different definition for it. But what I'm talking about when I say true mainstream adoption is people using blockchain apps, not because they're blockchain apps, but people using dApps because they're actually better than the current centralized apps they're using. So this could be a social media network from block one that actually pays you and incentivizes you to post good content and invite your friends. Or it could be a game like Blancos where instead of just playing a game and then, um, you know, sort of losing your progress in the game over time, not being able to take any of that value out, you actually own the characters in the game. You own the items in the game. You own all of it. And I think that's my really my hope for the next year is that people pick dApps 
not just because they're dApps, because you know the general public really doesn't care that something's decentralized, in my opinion, but that they pick dApps because they're truly better experiences that they actually want to use. And then, of course, this is kind of an interesting prediction. I'm hoping that uh, a Fortune 500 company will build on EOS in some way. Maybe it'll be Tesla through that company Test Loop that's archiving their uh, ride-sharing data on the EOS blockchain as a way to sort of have a backup for insurance purposes for their insurance Apple. company. Maybe it'll be... We heard a lot uh, of speculation on Apple, the Apple Pay and stuff. Yeah, a lot of speculation that Apple will bring their, their Apple card to EOS in some way. Maybe the tokenized reward points will be on EOS. But, uh, and obviously we've seen Samsung with their new secure enclave in their phones. They have a, a blockchain app to access it right there. Um, another great example of a huge company building on blockchain tech. So I'm really hoping we'll see some of them uh, dip their toes into the EOS waters. Maybe Apple will go up against Samsung. Samsung's kind of on the Ethereum train right now. Maybe Apple will say, hey, we like EOS a lot better. And my final hope for the next year, this is something that I really, really hope comes out at B1 June, but if not there, I think will come out at a later date over the next year, would be to make the EOS mainnet even more scalable than it is today. It's obviously the most scalable blockchain platform that exists today, the most scalable live blockchain platform. Um, it's broken so many records when it comes to usage. And right now, the dApps that are on EOS are you know, not pushing the network to its limits anymore. Those gambling dApps really did push the network to its limits. Uh, Block One issued a lot of upgrades to the EOSIO software that did about a 6x performance improvement. So if you have one EOS token right now, it's worth, uh, from a, a CPU power standpoint, about six EOS tokens um, would have been at the, the beginning of the mainnet launch. So pretty crazy performance improvements that we've seen, but I hope in order to, to enable that next generation of these multi-million user dApps that EOSIO will become even more scalable and we can apply all of that to the EOS mainnet as well. And of course, a presentation like this would not be complete without a big go EOS. So uh, oh, yes. whatever it is that happens over the next year, I'm super excited. Classic. Thank you, Rob. Thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll drop in the first question and then I'll let, let the, the guys in the community ask. Uh, listen, we're, we're missing to hear about Cypherglass, Rob. Uh, I think, uh, let me start, okay? So I'll give you the first pointer and then you'll give us three more. Uh, I'll say that Cypherglass, in my opinion, is at least on the top three block producers in terms of communications and onboarding users that don't know anything about EOS, about EOS and illustrating. I, I see your videos, videos in YouTube and, uh, and all the time Twitter fighting the FOD. So I think you're right up, up there in terms of communication. What are other three? Three things that you personally think that put Cypherglass on the leading top 21 producers. Yeah, I think one thing that a lot of people forget is that we were pretty instrumental in pushing people towards bare metal infrastructure, infrastructure that they actually own, that isn't just owned by Amazon or Google Cloud. And now actually every single block producer in the top 21 has bare metal infrastructure. So that's something I think that we've been very successful in. It's sort of a, a lesser point, but very, very important to the overall decentralization and performance of the network as a whole. Um, another thing I think that uh, we've done a lot to do is bring more dApps, bring more people over to EOS, obviously through those free consulting calls, but through investments as well, through strategic partnerships with people like Pixios, people like Dmail, who's bringing email over to EOS. I think we've done a lot to bring developers over. Um, whether it's through our sponsoring of the, the Everything EOS developer courses that just came out to offer those for free to everybody. Whether you vote for us or vote for anybody else, as long as you vote for a block producer, you can get those courses for free. Um, <laughs> in addition to that, uh, let's see, what else have we done? I can actually pull up a list if you'd like. I have a, a, a long give, list. Give us one last thing, Rob. You're from, from the heart. Why is Cypherglass a top block, block producer, in your, in your opinion? Honestly, I think we've had a, an incredibly strong commitment to the EOS mainnet since day one. So adding as much value back as possible, whether it's their education, developer education, um, onboarding, bringing more dApps over. And I think if you look at a lot of block producers, um, they, they sort of have their hands in a lot of different chains. And I think that's totally okay. I think that's great for the overall you know, crypto market. But when it comes to Cypherglass, we are really focused on EOS. And I think as a testament to that, all of the value that we're putting back into the system, all of our block rewards that we're reinvesting back in are going back into the EOS mainnet. So that's one of many reasons why I think uh, we should be back in the top 21. But we're obviously super, super happy to have all the votes that we have today. Awesome, bro. Thank you. I appreciate it. Tali's got a question for you. Yeah. Hey, awesome. Tali's leading YOLO. You remember I told you about YOLO? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Here Very cool. Congrats on your launch. That's great. 
Um, yeah, so some like, like general questions about the uh, like, uh, side chains and sister chains. So, like, from what, what I understand is that the, as opposed to like Ethereum or other blockchains, uh, in, in the first, uh, there was there are quite a lot of the uh, sister chains and uh, side chains. And like, I, I wonder why that happened and what do you think about it? Like, depends on the effect on the uh, adoption of EOS and the uh, the growth uh, looking at yeah, I think right now EOS is so interesting because it's obviously the, the the best tech that you can get to run a blockchain. So a lot of people saw that and they saw what the EOS mainnet was doing and maybe they liked say 90% of it. They liked all of the components except for the governance component. So I think the reason why we've seen so many side chains is that it's very easy to experiment with new concepts. And I think those experiments are great. Like if you look at Boss with a, a three second lib time, um, to bring down, you know, finality on transactions. That's been very cool to see experimented. Telos has some cool experiments with Worker Proposal Fund. Um, I think that's just kind of a, a testament to all of the innovation happening in EOS, where it, it takes a lot of coordination to innovate on the EOS mainnet. We've still been able to do it. The block producers get together and innovate. But with things like governance and big pieces like uh, the lib time, things like that are best to, to be experimented on separate networks. And then we can sort of evaluate if we want to bring them over to the EOS mainnet. Um, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, but isn't, it, isn't, isn't there like a risk that uh, there will be like, uh, because of all these uh, different chains, that there would, wouldn't be like consensus on one main chain uh, that people would use and instead like there would just be many ports like that? Yeah, I think my, my ultimate goal, what I hope happens, especially with side chains, is that I think the EOS mainnet itself will actually be a bunch of different chains that are all intertwined, that all use the same account system, all use the same EOS token. Um, but I do think that there's a benefit to, uh, with a lot of these other chains, even something like Telos, if they want that added security, they could actually publish their block headers to the EOS mainnet. So it's a way of kind of verifying the contents of a block on a side chain on the mainnet. Because if you change any transaction, any, any byte of data within um, a block on a, a side chain, it would change that block header, which is basically just a, a string of numbers. It's a hash. Um, so I think there, there are a lot of uses, and I think B1 June should hopefully give us some clarification also on block one's direction. Uh, Dan has said a lot about these millions of chains all being connected, and I think hopefully we'll learn more about that uh, here in a couple of weeks. Okay, okay, last question for Rob. Anyone? Rob, uh, okay, last question. Um, Recently, after the launch of Rex, I've seen uh, more than one wallet offering paying additional interest if you vote using their proxy, which is sort of like uh, buying votes for uh, certain BPs. What, what's your opinion on that? I, I think it's definitely interesting. Um, a lot of people are, are going to experiment in different ways to try to get votes. But personally, whenever I hear somebody giving out free interest, I, I tend to just stay away. Uh, because my first question is always, where does that interest come from? Are you just losing money to, to get these votes? Um, I've seen a lot of that as well, where, you know, they say if you deposit and lock up your tokens for a certain amount of time, you can earn 7% interest or something. But um, I, I always personally stay away from those just because I like to, to have control over my EOS. I don't like to deposit it into something. Um, but uh, it, the, the whole... Without the post, just, just for uh, voting for a specific proxy... Uh, oh, interesting. They're paying interest out of the BP's uh, earnings. Oh, interesting. I, I actually haven't seen uh, anybody doing that. I'll have to look into that. Rob, listen, I want to thank you personally. I mean, in, in the name of all the EOS Israel community for being here with us. You know, we, at least me, you know, we see, we see you all the time on YouTube and it's, it's really, really significant that you take the time to speak with us directly. We really appreciate it. And we're going to see you in DC, man. Awesome. Yeah. I'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. And of course, go EOS. Go EOS. Hey. Awesome. Thanks, guys. See you soon. See you later. Okay, uh, Chris, are you online? No. Wait, what? No. You're on. You are on. I'm on roll there. I'm a click. I got. Okay. 
Yes. Hi, Chris. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Ah, yes, we can hear you perfectly. Hello, Israel. Hello, Effect AI. <laughs> hey, thank you for being here with us, Chris. Yeah, it's my absolute pleasure. Thank you very, very much for, for having me, man. Yeah, thank you. So listen, tell us everything about Effect AI and specifically tell us everything about uh, why and how did you guys come from the Neo blockchain into EOS? That's always an interesting story here. And you got the stage, mate. All right, cool. Um, I guess what I'll do is I'll explain and do a little bit of a presentation for everybody um, to kind of kick things off. And then we'll get into the, the horrible story of Neo uh, and then the beautiful, wonderful story of um, EOS and, and how that came to be. Give That's me two seconds. Okay. Set this up for you guys. One sec, bang. All right, can you see the screen there, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah we, see, we see on the screen. Uh, All right, let me... Yeah, your EOS voter wallet. Yeah, Just hi there. You, you, <laughs> you, got it, you, got it on, you got it locked, so we can't see the balance. So that, uh, <laughs> yeah, jeez. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I thought I had this set up perfectly fine. Yeah, no, um, we, we're, trying to, we're trying to see who you're voting for, and we can. <laughs> you guys definitely have my vote. Trust me on that. Um, okay, so Effect.ai is an open and democratic decentralized network for artificial intelligence and machine learning development, um, whatever that means. <laughs> so the AI marketplace is set to be a $16.2 trillion global economy by 2030. So we're just basically getting started with the AI revolution, um, AI technology. It's at a very similar point as blockchain technology is today. It's at a very similar point as the internet was in the mid 90s. So if you think about how far we came, I'm sure there was many of us in that room, myself included, in the mid 90s going, what the heck are we going to do with this internet? We're at the same phase right now where the, a bunch of youth are thinking about how AI is going to develop, how blockchain is going to develop. And luckily, we're at the forefront of that trying to figure this out as well. And we're trying to solve a few problems in this industry. But if artificial intelligence development continues in the way that it's going right now, then that $16.2 trillion is going to be in the hands of a select few corporate entities. And we're here to, to try to change that. And if you ask, Ask my boy Elon Musk, he'll be the first one to tell you how important it is to take the power away from these big corporates. Um, we've all seen the movie uh, Terminator and Skynet. Uh, if we're not very, very careful on how AI is developed, then we're going to have something uh, you know, like Skynet. So the Effect Network, uh, what Effect.ai is building, is a three-part solution to help anybody in the world be able to train and build their um, artificial intelligence initiatives and algorithms, and then be able to monetize those initiatives. And then in the end phase, which is about a year away, be able to actually power those. So what that means is first, how you build an algorithm would be to structure data, enrich data enough that you can input that into a machine learning model to be able to create an algorithm. So it all starts with data. Um, and artificial intelligence is nowhere near as far as people believe it to be. People are still sitting on all types of data trying to figure out what they do with it. Um, so the very first phase that we have created is a micro-tasking marketplace to structure and enrich data for any organization anywhere in the world, whether it be government, whether it be NGOs, whether it be any kind of small or mid-sized business, it can be uh, <laughs> academic uh, research, um, so we help you build that. And the way that we help you build that is that we have a global workforce um, that covers several different cultures, different backgrounds, different languages to structure your data and build what you need uh, built. 
The second phase, after you've structured data, you've inputted that into a machine learning model and created your algorithm, if your algorithm and your solution is something that you feel the world would pick up and want to use, then we are creating what's called the effect smart market. This is a marketplace where anybody can buy and sell uh, algorithms and AI related services. So bits and pieces of algorithms can live in this marketplace and you can tap into certain types of algorithms or fully blown solutions that you can use within your, um, within your business uh, today. And then the third and final phase of the effect network is a distributed global supercomputer. Um, this just means it sounds fancy, but all it means is that people have computing resources all over the world. You have them in your computer as they're sitting there on your desk. You have extra compute that you can give into a pool and that pool of compute can actually run algorithms. It's very costly and it's very labor intensive to run algorithms, especially deep learning networks. Um, so with, with our platform, we're enabling people to um, uh, pool their energy together to run artificial intelligence uh, protocols. So the first one, we help you build it. The second one, uh, we help you monetize your, your solutions. And then the third one is uh, running your, your algorithm. So we started developing this about a year ago, just over a year ago. This pitch deck's a couple months old. Um, but where we've come to so far on our platform, we have over 2,000 global workers that are actively uh, structuring data sets for some of our clients. Um, these workers are from 90 different countries all over the world. Uh, the impact that this solution has um, for, for developing countries and people that are out of work that need to, to get work, they, they can come onto our platform. The wages are pretty good for, for structuring data right now. Um, we've already completed around 2 million micro tasks. So we've used the blockchain in each and every single one of these tasks. So as you do a micro task, you're paid in the decentralized cryptocurrency of the effect network called EFX. What, what, what exactly do the workers do, Chris? Well, uh, yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, so I can give you a few examples. So when it comes to structuring data, there's all kinds of different data um, points, right? So we have images, we have audio, we have text, we have all of these different things. So if you're building a chatbot, we're all, we're all working with chatbots these days. When we work with customer service online, we ask a question, we get an answer. There's a picture of a beautiful girl beside uh, the, the questions and answers, but it's not really her. It's just an algorithm that's answering questions. Um, so in this, this way, this is a, a chat bot and this is developed by a few different ways of structuring data. So there's text extraction where you'll take a whole bunch of sentences that customers may be asking and you take out key words. Um, so an algorithm can start understanding, okay, this person is asking this type of question. They want a refund. So I'm going to either direct them in this category. Or I'm going to try to answer this question. Um, this also goes with voice recognition. So when you're training a ch chat bot and you want your chat bot to understand uh, what a human is saying. So for example, like Siri, you need to structure all of those sentences. They need to understand how to listen and hear all of those sentences very much so in different accents and, and different languages. And then they input that into their system. They'll turn it into text and then they'll do a search. Um, so this is for chatbots. This is a, a branch of artificial intelligence called uh, natural language processing, also known as NLP. So we deal with a lot of these tasks right now. We're under an NDA not to chat about um, who we're working with, but we have some pretty spectacularly big clients when it comes to text extraction and figuring out uh, that kind of thing for chatbots, but also for other means. So there's those types of tasks. Some of the very first tasks that we put onto the platform were uh, image classification. So this is another thing to train an algorithm. When you go on to something like um, Shutterstock and you're looking for an image, uh, for example, you're looking for an image of a Siamese cat. You put in the word Siamese cat and then you get a whole bunch of images of Siamese cats. Um, a lot of people, they don't even think about how that happens, you know? We're so used to Google and the Google algorithms and they work exactly the same way that you have to label and tag um, data so that data shows up when you put in these keywords. Just 
like an e-commerce site when you're looking for a blue dress or you're looking for brown shoes, you put in these search terms and then all of a sudden images of that come up. So that has, uh, that has to be annotated by a human workforce to actually tag those images saying brown shoes and, and blue dress or Siamese hat. So image classification is another one. So this is a very simple task. And I'll give you one example of a client that we work with, one of our launching clients. Um, they have a website very, very much like Shutterstock. So they have 1.6 billion images um, on their platform. They're called Lobster Media. This is where you can go and you can buy rights to certain images. Their algorithm, and when it comes to algorithms for searching pictures, they're absolutely phenomenal. In that branch of artificial intelligence, it, it's absolutely great. You can, absolutely, you can look up anything. Um, but one problem that they had with their algorithm, there is no way to tell if an image was taken as a selfie or it wasn't a selfie. So we uploaded 200,000 images and we had our workforce just answer the simple question, yes or no, is this a selfie or is this not a selfie? With only 200,000 images, they trained their algorithm to a 97% accuracy to tell if an image was taken as a selfie or taken as a regular shot. So this is another, um, uh, another thing. Uh, another example of, of a client that we have is the government of Singapore. So the government of Singapore is one of our bigger clients. And what they are doing is they're annotating and structuring satellite imagery. This is a very interesting thing because people think um, that Google Maps is the go-to place for satellite imagery, for mapping, for all of this stuff. And so when they came to us as a client, I asked my tech team, because I, I, I don't have a background in artificial intelligence, I said, why don't they just use Google Maps? Um, and the reason being is that Google Map owns all of that data. They own all of their own satellite data. They own all of Google Maps data. And you can connect via API, which is fairly expensive, but it's also very limited. So they, they really wanted to um, create their own Google Maps so they can supply that to their citizens and to the people um, and, and to themselves to use it in, internally so we have structured almost the entire country of Singapore um, in many different ways <laughs> just separating anything from water and buildings and and that kind of stuff and then actually annotating and drawing polygons around points of interests like uh, restaurants and labeling those and pinpointing them just like Google Maps for for um, for the government of Singapore. So there's many, many different ways to structure data. There's many different data points that can be structured and we basically deal with, with all of them. Um, so just to get back to, to, to the presentation, um, we have a team of, of quite a few. We have about 15 people internally working on this, this, these platforms and these solutions. We have great advisors like Charlie Schrem and Sally Eves working uh, very closely with us. We have 45 global ambassadors that are helping all of our initiatives going forward. And we have a global community of 60,000 people that are kind of following along and, and rooting us on across our newsletter and all of our socials. Um, so just an example of what centralized and decentralized AI looks like. You have the Googles and the Facebooks that really keep this hidden behind closed doors. They're working with their own data and our objective in our, our um, uh, yeah, our, our value proposition is to open up data, um, to create data, to collectively have all humans be able to, to access data, to create algorithms in an open environment and be able to work together to collaborate and to catch up to the guys like Google and Facebook. So that's why we're working with governments, we're working with large organizations because they understand that Google, Facebook and, and these big corporates have a big jump start on where we are with artificial intelligence. Um, yeah, that's basically the, the, the presentation and I can get into the story of why EOS and how EOS and, and how that's happened if, if people would like to hear it. First of all, thanks a lot. Sure. Chris, uh, a question about Effect AI. So what's the level of trust that relies on the single workers? Like if a, if a worker, I don't know, he's, he's a bit daltonic and he has to identify a red, uh, a red flag and he sees it green. You know, what's the level of, um, of, of system error that lies in that single worker uh, relying on that, right? Yeah, that, that, that's a wonderful question. And uh, when people are listening, uh, then, then I know that that question is coming. So thanks for listening and, and uh, thanks for the question. 
Um, so this, this comes with many different safeguards and that's our point of difference from centralized microtasking marketplaces like Amazon Mechanical Turk is um, being able to validate that the work and the quality of the work is done uh, correctly and right. So we do this through a whole bunch of different uh, variables. So first we have a reputation score of our workforce. So the longer you've been working on, uh, uh, on the platform, the more reputation you're going to get for good work. The way that we validate that you've done good work initially is through what we call master validators. So this is a, a group of people that have been working with us. Um, it's us as well internally right now that takes subsets of uh, workers' work and we validate that they're doing it right. If they pass that test, then they gain reputation. So if your data set is very, very important to get the quality correct and right, um, then you would pick workers with a higher reputation. It might cost you a little bit extra, but you're, you're basically guaranteed that the work is going to get done right. So that's the, the, the first safeguard is, is reputation system. The second safeguard is that validation system. And then the third one that we're introducing once we migrate all of our technology over to EOS um, is staking for the workers. So this is another way of ensuring that there's good quality. So a worker working on effect force, if they want to get access to higher paying tasks, then they have to stake a little bit of their EFX, a little bit of their holdings um, to say that I am committed to doing good work. And if you catch me being a bad actor and doing bad work, then I understand that I will lose my stake. Um, so we also have that. Additionally to that, we have qualifying tasks. So you first have to qualify um, for, for um, a certain type of task. So for example, we just started working with another client. Um, it was a very specific, very hard um, task to do. We went through all 2000 workers, we put it to them, only 73 of them passed the test. So those 73 are now consigned to do the work for this requester because they know that they can do it. So there's many ways, and we also guarantee to the requester if they're not satisfied with the structured data, then they don't have to pay a cent. So um, that's kind of our value proposition and what sets us apart from everybody in the centralized world and anybody that's coming out with this stuff. That's awesome, awesome. Any questions for Chris? Yeah, about why you didn't have to eat it. Let's, let, so let's spend a few minutes hearing about, so what, what, what percentage of your platform, what parts of your platform do you have on Neo? What parts are NEOs and what, what parts are centralized in, in a kind of a client server base? Yeah, okay, so right now we built out uh, Effect Force, our, our first microtasking platform on NEO. That's still running on NEO and it has a decentralized payment mechanism and that's basically um, what's running there. We will be bringing that over to EOS uh, mid-June, uh, maybe mid-end June. That will be a complete full uh, relaunch of Effect Force with new clients, with new big, incredibly huge news of, of new clients. Um, I can't disclose, I wanna disclose, I wanna yell it to the world and tell everybody, but I can't. Um, so I, I won't do that. Um, what we have moved over to EOS has been an incredible journey for our tech team. We were at the London Hackathon uh, in uh, last year, late last year. We learned all about the, the uh, EOS platform, how to build we on it. To, to yes, uh, yes we, we met there. Yep, we met there. I actually, I was undercover because we were building on Neo, but I had some people in my network to, to actually um, invite me over there. So I, I was uncovered by a few of the, the mentors and a few of the people participating. They said, wait a minute, why the hell are you here? You're, you're on the Neo blockchain. And I said, listen, I'm, I'm in the blockchain community, um, but we're exploring other options, so we'll see what happens. But I was so inspired that I actually won the, the most valuable mentor of the, the, the whole hackathon, um, just helping out these teams. So it was an incredible thing. So to, to go back, we decided we were going to migrate to, to EOS a, a couple of months ago. Our team started building solutions. So right now we have migrated our token uh, and we did that by building a, a token swap protocol. Um, it was a pretty complex thing. So it was very much different than Shio's protocol. That's kind of a central swap, a centralized swap, where you take tokens, you put it in one wallet, that wallet is validated by somebody and then they're, they're created on the next blockchain. Uh, we did a decentralized token swap protocol. Um, we were gonna do an ato atomic swap, but it would have been too expensive. But uh, yeah, immediately within uh, about 
10, uh, because of the NEO blockchain, 22 seconds for the NEO blockchain, uh, a half second for the EOS blockchain, and the token swap is live. So we built the token swap protocol. We also built a um, staking protocol, which allows people to stake their EFX for a new token called NFX. So this is a very complex uh, algorithm as well that we were able to create on EOS, and that's live. And then, yeah, once Effect Force, that technology is over to EOS, then there's nothing left on the NEO blockchain. Is that protocol open source, Chris? Can anyone can access it? Absolutely anybody can access it. Yep, the, the token... The, the token swap protocol that we have a lot of NEO um, uh, connections that are looking into migrating to EOS. So they've reached out. Um, so yeah, they can, uh, that's open source and they can use the token swap. They'll have to build their own front end, but that's, yeah, that's uh, definitely available to them. The staking protocol, I believe that's already open source. And I think we're going to be working with Karma. Karma is going to be using this uh, type of staking protocol. The staking protocol gives you a multiplier on how long you've staked your tokens. So we have an exponential growth period of rewards for people, and then it goes to linear after a certain time frame. So it gives early adopters an advantage over people that are finding out about projects and staking uh, tokens after the people that have originally done it. So, um, it's a pretty interesting um, protocol. So yeah, er everything that we develop is open source. When we come over to EOS, we are also open sourcing Effect Force. Uh, that whole entire platform, people are going to be able to join us to build on top of that and, and build that out with us with worker proposals. And we just want to make this a distributed team, a global effort to, to, to build out uh, all of our technology. So, um, yeah, that's the deal. That's awesome. So, Chris, I want to thank you very much for joining us. You know, you're, you, you're one of the best projects we consider. So, so thank you for joining us. And um, you told me you're not going to be in Washington. You have uh, like a hectic time, huh? Yeah, listen, all of us got the invites because uh, our two uh, founders were also at the, the hackathon. Um, and we, we did get an invite, uh, but unfortunately, we all have really crazy schedules and crazy commitments during that time. We all tried to, to, to you know, sacrifice what we were doing to make it, but um, yeah, we're, we're, we're building the future, so we, we have to stay on course and focus. So yeah, enjoy your time there. I'm sure it's going to be very much like the vibe of the hackathon in London, which was the greatest time of my life. That, that few days was honestly like, uh, from going from Bitcoin meetups four years ago in Melbourne, Australia, with five dorks in a room telling me that Bitcoin's going to skyrocket and take over the world, to seven uh, uh, to seven hundred participants building on blockchain technology, I was in tears the whole time. So I'm sure I'm sure that DC is going to be a wonderful blast for everybody, and I'm sorry to miss it, but uh, drink an extra beer for me. We should, Will, and remember you're, you're actually celebrating the one year of years with us now, so... Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, phenomenal, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate the, the EOS ecosystem. Um, most of the block producers reaching out and, and working with us and talking with us and, and inviting us to things just like this, your meetups. Um, we, we couldn't be more excited about, uh, you know, building on EOS and joining that community because uh, it feels like a community. And I think that's a very important part if you're ever going to want to gain mass adoption and, and grow. So yeah, uh, we're very excited. For sure, for sure. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Chris. And I'm, I'm gonna see you in private in a few days. Let's, let's keep chatting. Yeah, cool, man. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks, yeah. guys. Bye. Take care. Thank you, bye-bye. Mm -hmm.